Hello everyone, my name is Sander Eretz and I will be your host for today's Maxwell Connects. I would like to welcome all of you to our very first episode of Maxwell Connects and I hope you will join us on this interesting scientific journey. In each session, we will highlight one topic that is key to the daily operations at Maxwell Biosystems. These topics will range from scientific applications and data analysis but also include topics such as drug discovery and electrophysiology in general. Today, we will focus on one of our main scientific applications, namely retina research. Have you ever wondered how we collect information from the environment and send it to our brain to process? Well, one of the main ways is through our eyes and in particular, our retina. That's why it's key that we understand how the retina functions but also how it's part of our central nervous system. Together with us today is Dr. Zillard Scheigo. He's a member of our scientific team and an expert in retina research. Dr. Scheigo completed his PhD at the National Eye Institute in the NIH Retinal Circuit Development and Genetics Unit. He also remained in this lab for one year as a postdoc. After this, he moved to Denmark, where he was a postdoc at the Danish Research Institute of Translational Neuroscience, named Dandrite. Since last year, he joined us at Maxwell Biosystems as an application scientist. Welcome, Dr. Shigo. Hi, Sanders. Uh, please call me Silad. <laughs> Thank you, Zillard. Zillard, you've been working in the retina field for almost 10 years now. Could you maybe tell me, but also the audience, what the retina exactly is and why it's so important? Well, uh, before I start, I can just actually tell you that I measure right now during this extended uh, home office period. Uh, you and many others have already tiny websites burned onto your retina from watching the monitors. And this is not necessarily a good thing for your, for your eye health and your retina health. And if you now take a moment to, to glance away from these websites and you close your eyes for uh, just five seconds, and thus you realize actually how important sight is for you yes. and now if you imagine living permanently like that that is what basically many people worldwide have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, according to the world health, world health organization we have uh, roughly 285 million people with some sort of visual impairment globally and out of this, around 40 million people are considered legally blind. Uh, thus, we need to develop therapies and uh, pharmaceutical approaches to help these people. But before we can do that, or before we could do that, we needed to better understand of actually what the retina is, what is its structure, and how does it actually function. And this is not a new question. As early on as in the, in the 1600s, Already René Descartes, in his book Le Dioptric, he has looked at the retina, uh, he has dissected human eyes, and he actually calls the retina a, a delicate, tender flesh, which is like a third skin. A third skin? Why exactly a third skin? He just calls it a third skin because at that time when he would do these dissections, he could only distinguish the three major layers of, of, of the eyeball. He could see the sclera, of course, the most outer layer. He could see the, the vascular layer, the choroid. And then, of course, he could see this very thin, delicate, basically, skin, which actually we now know is, is the retina. And in, in general terms, the retina is nothing more than a, a, a very thin, delicate tissue at the back of the eye that actually translates uh, images into electrical signals and then sends these signals to the brain. It is made out of approximately 60 different cell types, and some cell types uh, are responsible for this light conversion into electrical signals, while other cell types uh, process this visual information and send it to the brain. And then, of course, once this information reaches the brain, the brain interprets the visual world that we see around you. And to continue your question, why the retina? Uh, why study the retina? Despite the peripheral location of the retina, the, your retina is actually part of your central nervous system because during embryonic development, it actually emerges, it's formed from the same divisions 
that also give uh, structures to many other areas of the forebrain. And it's also a very well defined uh, circuit. So it has a very well defined circuit. And most of the units in these circuits, we nowadays know what they do and how they are connected. Uh, other advantages of sexually uh, studying the retina, I mean, when you, for instance, remove the retina from, from the eyeball, right, you can do that without damaging these interneural connections. You can uh, record from this retina ex vivo for an extended period of time for several hours. You can modulate this natural input, which is basically light, and you can modulate this by different light patterns and light intensities. And also, you can generally clearly define the retinal outputs in the form of electroretinograms and in the form of action potentials. Wow, I think, I think those are some very significant numbers you mentioned about visual impairment and blindness that really show how important it is to understand how the retina functions. But how come so much is already known about the retina? I mean, a lot is known about the retina because we have been studying the structure of the retina for a long time now. Uh, first detailed structures and uh, cell types that make up the retina were already provided by Cajal in, in as early as 1892. And ever since then, retina scientists, once it comes to cellular morphology, are basically just playing catch up to Cajal. I'm so sorry to interrupt there, but uh, two, two questions. First of all, how could he already do this in the 1890s? But also, what exactly do you mean with your last sentence about scientists catching up nowadays? Well, Carl could do this uh, this time because he was using a method roughly developed in, in the same time period, which is called uh, Golgi staining, uh, developed by Camilla Golgi. And this is nothing more than a, a silver impregnation method. And the advantage of this method is that it sparsely labels neurons. So instead of labeling the entire neurons, right, all the neurons in a particular tissue like the retina, it could label individual ones. So thus, when Carl would take his slide uh, that was stained, a retina slide, put it under the microscope, he can visualize individual neurons, and then he can draw these neurons and make an accurate depiction of these neurons. And for these, for their work, uh, Kahal and Golgi together in 1906 got the Nobel Prize for this. And the other, for, to the answer to your second question, what do I mean by, by scientists playing catch up? Uh, many descriptions and many papers coming out recently about cell uh, morphology in the retina and cell types in the retina. These are basically just rediscoveries of cell types that Kahal already drew and already the showed to us in early 1900s. Okay, okay, thank you. And what exactly happened after Cajal? Well, after Cajal, some other milestones that maybe led to Nobel Prize was the Nobel Prize of Gulstrand and his work, where he was basically analyzing the dioptics of the eye and how different structures in the eye refract light. And uh, what we need to also note that many of these initial discoveries, also including the discovery of Poyak when he described for the first time retinal ganglion cell types in, in human, many of these uh, early discoveries all relate to morphology and structure. They don't really relate to function. Uh, later on, the, the functional discoveries came while starting, for instance, with a major milestone by uh, highlighting Barlow, Levick, and Oyster's work, where for the first time they were able to show us that we do have ganglion cells that are direction selective in the eye, that uh, selectively respond to light moving in one direction versus the other direction. And then for the very first time, for instance, in the 1970s, Boycott and Wesley gave us intracellular, by uh, doing intracellular recordings, the first link between cellular morphology and cellular physiology. So now they could tell you that this is ganglion cell type A and this ganglion cell type A is actually doing this. And this is ganglion cell type B and ganglion cell type B is doing this. So this was the very first attempt of linking morphology to function. Then another notable Nobel Prize came in uh, the form of Hubel and Wiesel for information processing in your visual system. So what they have done is basically they managed to record from the visual cortex of the cat 
and they kind of made the very first links of how this visual cortex interprets signals coming from your retina and how then it tries to process them. So there are really numerous Nobel Bell Prizes related to the eye that we've heard you talk about now. Yes, there were actually several prizes given for uh, studies relating to the eye or visual function, and some of them we can talk about in, in some later slides. Uh, but with the invent of modern genetic manipulations and modern genetic techniques, well, already in late 2017, we got, for instance, the very first uh, gene therapy approved by the FDA was for retinal disease, and we need to highlight this was the very first gene therapy ever to be approved was for retinal disease caused by mutations in the RP65 gene. And then the same year, the very first clinical trials of implanting uh, stem cell derived retinal pigment epithelium cells into macular degenerating patients also has happened. And the focus of, of today's science is not just to look at individual cell types, but also manipulate individual cell types. Now with the, the advent of, of, of course, genetic cloning and gene manipulation, we can have retinas where we can selectively label or even ablate or modify different cell types and then look at the outlook, not just at the level of the retina, but also at the level of behavior, for instance. Another very important uh, milestone in, in retina research was uh, in the early 2000s when Sasai, uh, published this protocol of actually making retina in a dish. Re retina in a dish, you said? Yes, so it, it is actually what it, like, like it sounds like it sounds like it is a retina dish. And what I mean by this is that he could just uh, now take cells from patients with, with healthy patients or uh, disease patients, he could just take somatic cells. Uh, with his protocol, he could reprogram these cells and he can actually push these cells to form retinal cups. And then these retinal cups, they also have the shape of the retina, they also have the structure and the neural connections of the retina. So by this, it is now possible to actually mimic retinal disease phenotypes in a dish with this method. That's, a, that's amazing. I, I never knew that retinal research has progressed so much over the last 100, 150 years. But if we really focus on the retinal function, what are some of the key technological advancements that allowed scientists to understand in detail how the, the retina works? Well, once it comes to the scientific advances that led to basically describing the physiology of these cells, we can narrow it down to three major ones. Of course, the, the, the most important and the state-of-the-art technique that is still currently used for all of retina research is the patch clamp. And also, the, we should note that the invent of the patch clamp by Neyer and Sackman, again, won another Nobel Prize. And what patch clamp is, in simple terms, it's you just take a glass pipette, you penetrate the cell, and you record signals. And these signals offer really high-quality information because they, with these, you can measure the current flow through certain channels in, in your cell. And this gives you a huge advantage because you can really characterize in detail on what is happening in these neurons, for instance, in ganglion cell neurons during action potentials. Uh, only thing with this technique is that uh, it's relatively low throughput. And it takes actually quite a lot of time to gain expertise and training to this technique. But it still remains one of the gold standard techniques in, in retina studies. Uh, the other technique that we need to mention is basically uh, calcium imaging, where uh, this was invented in the early uh, 90s. And this allows you to record the electrical activity uh, basically with the fluorescence microscope. Uh, with the invent of these tiny fluorescent molecules that respond uh, to calcium binding. And once they bind calcium, they basically just give up fluorescence. And with this technique, you can kind of indirectly but accurately measure action potential generations. Uh, just quickly, Zillard, but in the case of the retina, wouldn't the fluorescence not only activate the reporter, but also the photoreceptors? 
Yes, so that's actually a very good point. But uh, again, during this time, uh, another really important discovery uh, by Wilfred Deng, who developed with together with his colleagues, developed the very first two photon microscope, where you can actually target, for instance, in your case, the ganglion cells that you would record with a two photon image. Thus, you would not saturate and not bleach your photoreceptors in, in the tissue. So, for instance, in retina application, yes, you do need specialized microscopes and you do need a two photon microscope in order to do this in retina tissue. Okay. Um, and then the third one, uh, the third major method that people are using and more and more frequently is uh, MEAs. And these, what I mean by MEA, these are microelectrode arrays. And um, these basically right now they are very high have very high densities and give, could give access to record every single cell in your sample and the advance the advantage of this method is that you do not need uh, microscopy you know like in the calcium imaging and you can actually uh, record hundreds or even thousands of your ganglion cells in your tissue interesting out of the I mean, you mentioned now patch clamp, calcium imaging, and also an MEA system, and you briefly touched upon the advantages of using an MEA system. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on these and also tell us what exactly you can measure from the retina using an MEA system? So um, using an MEA system from the retina, you can measure basically two things. Uh, one, you can measure uh, micro ERGs. And these are uh, the waveforms generated by uh, summarized activity of different cells in the retina, or you can measure action potentials of ganglion cells. And how, how does this experiment basically fall? unfold is you just take the piece of retina, you do a particular dissection and cleaning of the retina, you place it onto the MEA surface, and then you shine light with different patterns onto it. Now, this is relatively an old technique. It, it, for the very first time, it was used in 94 by Meister, Pina, and Baylor, where they recorded action potentials from uh, a salamander retina. Uh, just to highlight a bit more, uh, what we can actually record is uh, one of the recordings is uh, microelectroretinogram, as I told you. And microelectroretinogram is basically very similar. Uh, to uh, electroretinogram. And the electroretinogram was for the very first time recorded in frog in 1865 already. And then later on, these waveforms, these generated waveforms were split into three waves. And for instance, there was another Nobel Prize that uh, certain aspects of ERG discovery played a major role towards uh, in the form of granite in, in 1933. And what the ERG is, is, as I told you before, it's just a summarized waveform of uh, activity of multiple cell types in the retina, and it composes out of an A, B, and C wave. And for instance, the A wave is a summarized uh, potential of uh, photoreceptors, B wave is summarized potential of on bipolar cells, and then the C wave is just activity of retinal pigment epithelium cells. But these are already way too detailed and for your general audience. Another output that you can uh, look at from the retina with using microelectrode arrays are action potentials. And action potentials are mostly generated by retinal ganglion cells and one other emacrine uh, cell type. And what you can actually use these uh, action potentials, or what can you read out of them, basically? Uh, and just like I mentioned you, Barlow and Levick's work in 1965, where they showed for the first time direction selectivity among ganglion cells, using MEA, of course, you can do the same readout. You can look at ganglion cell types. You can analyze whether they have certain direction selectivity preferences. You can look at their receptive fields, what is the actual area where they gather light from and process light from in the outside world. Uh, you can look at the response properties of these cells, whether they are uh, activated by light or suppressed by light. And of course, uh, with MEA, you can nowadays also look at the axons of these cells and how they propagate the signal from the cell towards uh, the, your brain. 
Th thank you, Zillow, for the clear explanation on how an MEA system can be used to investigate the retina and some of the key readouts that we can derive from that. I'm a little bit also curious about the different fields of retina research and some insights on why they're being studied nowadays, going back to the numbers you mentioned at the beginning of this session. Well, the different view that the, diff the reason why you can actually uh, study retina, what you can study from retina, we can kind of boil it down to six major areas, right? Uh, you can take the retina, you can do drug screenings with it, you can uh, analyze disease phenotypes uh, using retina, you can uh, analyze visual restoration, uh, how successful your therapy is. You can analyze uh, different aspects of development. For instance, like we talked before, these direction selective circuits, when do they develop and how are they formed? Uh, you can actually look at the, the circuit dynamics and how these circuits fo form and how these circuits also work in the form of visual processing, how they process visual information and different aspects of it. And of course, we can also do tissue manipulation or activity manipulation with the event of optogenetics nowadays. Siddhar, just quickly going back to the diagram of the disease phenotyping, on there you showed the photoreceptors. Do these photoreceptors have a high significance for retina diseases? Uh, yes, so photo photoreceptors have a huge significance for once it comes to, to visual impairment and diseases because the vast majority of diseases uh, that then later leave, lead to visual impairment all involve rods or cones or different aspects of retinal pigment epithelium. So the, the outer segment of the retina is always severely affected in the majority of diseases. There are known diseases that affect ganglion cells, for instance, glaucoma or certain amacrine cell types like congenital nystagmus, but these are, don't play such a huge role in, in the global numbers for visual impairment, like, like the outer segment. Thank you, Zillard. I think that these six applications from drug screening to optogenetics and the retinal disease example really indicate the extent of retinal research today. Could you maybe also provide me and also the audience with a clear example in which retina through the means of an MEA system clearly impact society significantly? And also, how did it do this? I mean, the impact to society, of course, is, is coming from therapies. Like we mentioned previously, the case of the RP65. Uh, the, approach is, uh, the approach is basically to have disease models, or either animal or human tissues, where you can try different things, and scientists are trying different things. Uh, to certain levels of success, of course. Uh, one thing that you can do is you can do cell transplantations, where you can take healthy cells and transplant them into a sick retina, like we previously mentioned uh, the work of uh, Dr. Takahashi with the RP transplantation. Or you can apply different drugs to try and rescue the phototransduction cascade. Or what people are been uh, using uh, <clears throat> is gene therapies and gene therapies via uh, viral uh, transduction and also they are now combining viral therapies with optogenetics and what i mean by this is um, for instance if you have a retina where your outer segments are not working or your photoreceptors are not working uh, what can you actually do and the approach until now was to take uh, small ion channels that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And these are now abundantly available and they were discovered initially from algae and bacteria. Uh, and what do they do? So these ion channels are, as I said, sensitive to different light wavelengths and they open when the light shines on them and they allow for an ion influx. Uh, and now we have several studies where they could take some more of these uh, ion channels, and these are called channelrhodopsins or halorhodopsins. They delivered them using viruses into sick photoreceptors or bipolar cells, or now recently we also have reports in delivering them into directly to ganglia cells. And with these, they are able to show using MEA systems 
light recovery in these uh, animal models. For instance, in the case of uh, RD1 animals, this is uh, RD1 is a model for retinal degeneration. So these mice lack photoreceptors. And as you can see in the diagram, so pre-treatment, these animals show absolutely no light sensitivity, no, no light response. And with the, with the MEA, you can highlight this relatively easier. You can take the retina, you place it on the MEA, you shine line, light onto the retina tissue, and you're just looking at the spiking activity. Do you have uh, related spiking activity related to light onset or you don't? And as you can see, after treatment, after they take these channels and infect, for instance, uh, bipolar cells, and they do the same procedures, you can now see that light response was recovered in these treated retinas. Uh, and basically, this is how you can use the MEA system to highlight the efficiency of your therapeutic approach, not just at, at the single cell level, as you can do with patch clamp, but also as a, at the tissue level, at the system level. And this makes it possible now. Uh, those are some very impressive real-life examples of using the MEA system uh, to examine the functioning of a retina. It really seems that there is still a bright future and also a wide range of possibilities to investigate the retina further using an MEA system. Do you have any closing remarks for our audience? Yes, I mean, as a closing remark, we can say that this third skin of Descartes is now, uh, we know it's a highly sophisticated neuronal structure that basically enables us to perceive the world. And what we need to realize is that, for instance, we can close on another Descartes quote, is to live without philosophizing or discovery is the same as keeping your eyes closed without ever attempting to open them. Thank you, that's, that's some brilliant food for thought for our audience. Siddharth, I would like to thank you for your time today and for the amazing introduction you gave us to retina research. To our audience, that was it for our very first episode of Maxwell Connects. Today we learned why it is important to study retina and how it has evolved over the last 100 to 150 years. We saw that in addition to patch clamp and calcium imaging, an MEA system can provide huge benefits to researchers studying the functioning of the retina. And lastly, we learned that there's a wide range of applications ranging from drug screening and vision restoration to optogenetics of which we really heard an impactful case from Zillard towards curing blindness at the end. I would also like to thank all of you for listening. And if you would like to know more about the retina and how an MEA system can be used to study it, feel free to contact us at info at mxwbio.com. For now, I'd like to say stay tuned for more episodes of Maxwell Connects and see you soon.